Good morning, everyone. Good to be here with you. I wasn't supposed, actually, I was supposed to be, and then I wasn't supposed to be, and then the reports of my death were premature. But uh, yeah, a week ago, I had a hole cut in my head, and uh, it was in a Jewish hospital, and I told him I had to get out by Sukkoth, and gave him a, I got a little premillennial message to the world out there. It's uh, good to be with you. This is my 62nd Feast of Tabernacle. So uh, I've been doing this for a long time. My mom came in when I was two, and, but we went to Big Sandy for the feast and when I was four. And so I grew up with the church and uh, had the privilege of going to what was Imperial Schools, which was a church school, and having Bible every day of my life for 12 years of grade and high school and four years of college. And, and I've actually flew with Mr. Armstrong for 12 years and saw the gospel preached around the world and watched miracles happen, and the good and the bad, and everything in the church from the first century on has been a mixture, and so it's a, it's a special thing to be here, but for God to uh, put me back together so quickly, which again surprised the hospital and everybody else, because you, know, you get a three-inch hole in your head, you're not supposed to be up here talking, and my mom always said you need that like a hole in your head, well, I, I finally needed one, <laughs> so, uh, so I got it. And uh, trying to convince one skeleton and everybody that I was still alive and could speak was more challenging, actually, than trying to get well. But uh, so, uh, so I had a chance to come here. And so uh, miracles do happen. God does things that no one, no one else can do. And I've learned to live on those for my 62 years and, and uh, going to the feasts and things because God does wonders constantly if you have the faith to believe him and to do what he says. My biggest miracle today is going to be the sermon I was going to give you in doing it in 15 minutes. And uh, that'll, that's a big miracle for most of us. I teach speech at Ambassador Bible College along with some of the Bible classes and things. And it's a wonderful program. It, we basically do the curriculum of what was Ambassador College years ago, all the Bible classes in nine months. And to have young people 18 to, to 70 come and spend nine months just going through every scripture in the Bible, basically, on the Pentateuch, the writings, the Psalms, the prophets, you know, the, the gospels, the uh, epistles. It's a, it's a good program. We have young people from all different groups that, that come in, and our rule is that we do not try to proselytize. We don't, we, this, this is what the Bible is. I mean, Christ taught a way of life. He didn't teach Christianity. He, he taught a way of God, and that's what we want to teach is what does God want us to do? And that's really where, uh, where we all need to be. And uh, we've gotten away from some of those things at times through tradition, through various things. And like I said, we've had 2,000 years of Christianity that have been a, a mixture of all sorts of good and bad. I made a message, if you want to hear the whole thing, it's actually online, but uh, I call it removing the thorns. Because in Isaiah 51.3, and again, I don't want to just talk about me because I want to talk about the message that we're here for for the feast. In Isaiah 51, 3, it says, The Lord shall comfort Zion, will comfort her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. What was it about the garden of Eden that God had in mind? Was it about just food or was it something more? You know, in Genesis 2, when you go there, it says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth that they were created in the day of the Lord. And he made all these things. And we think about people, but we don't think about the creation itself. And then we see he planted a garden in Eden, and he put them there. And he put two trees in there, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, along with all the other furnishings and things. And he gave them great variety, delicacies, things. And he told them they could freely eat of all the things that he gave them. And he worshiped with them. He was there. He ate with them. He sat with them. And he told them if they ate of the wrong tree, that they would die. And we've had 6,000 years of death since that time. It's interesting when we look at the fact that his first children he put there, he created a perfect place for them. He wanted to have a relationship with his creation, with his first two children, and with their children, and with all of us. It was a place to go, a garden. Where do we go? We want to take our families out. We look for a garden. We look for a place to go. And that's what he wanted. He wanted a relationship with his creation, one that would be permanent, one which we share today in these feasts. 
And yet Satan came to the garden in Genesis 3, and he told them a lie. He spun the truth. You're not going to die. And they didn't die immediately, but they did die. And, of course, he raised the level of desire. He said, this tree is great for food. It makes you wise. And he spun all those truths, and their eyes were open without the true knowledge. And so they fell. But they used to be happy to see God. And when God would come and eat with them and talk with them and things, and then after they ate the tree, you read in in Genesis 3 where he says, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? Well, I'm, I was naked. I hid myself, and I was ashamed. Kind of like a little child. That, you, know, you do something wrong, a little kid goes, hides in the closet. And so they were hiding, and they knew that they had done something wrong. And God knew where they were, but I think it's interesting. Where are you, Adam? What have you done? And then in verse 18 of Genesis 3, I think something that's very interesting. Verse 17, I'll read. Adam said, Because you have hearkened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree, which I command you not to eat. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herbs of the field. So the land itself was cursed along with everything else. Thistles and thorns will it bring to you. But God didn't want that to be that way. And even in their sin, he helped them because the city made clothes for them out of skins because fig leaves don't hold up too well in, <laughs> in uh, clothing. And he helped them. He didn't leave them alone. But now they were no longer in the same relationship with God that they had been. And that was what was missing. They got new senses. They understood shame. They understood guilt. They understood those things. But they did not have God in their world. They had a new God, a new sheriff in town, the God of this world. That was the beginning of the separation from man with God right there. And man has been hiding ever since then except for the few people that he's called along the way, a few prophets in the Old Testament, from righteous Abel up to today, a few people here and there that have learned through Christ and his sacrifice about the way of life. Adam and Eve had a brand new house to live in. We are going to have to redecorate a world that has been destroyed. We've got a house that's been used, and we're going to have to renovate that house and make it work. You know, you look in a garden... If you're like me, if I leave my garden alone, it comes back to thistles and thorns. It goes back right away. It doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't turn into the Garden of Eden. You have to work and toil to make that work. Just like it was cursed. He said it was, and it has been. So we take our children to parks, and we do things that we can to to make things nicer as much as possible. But without God and that relationship, it's never going to be the same as it would be with him in the picture. Now, if I'm in the middle of my sermon. I'll just give you, you can read uh, Isaiah, uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Micah, and that'll cover the middle part of my sermon for you. But uh, I'll skip down toward the end, the point I want to make there. In uh, Zechariah 3, 9, Zechariah writes, or God writes through Zechariah, Behold the stone I've laid before Joshua, the stone shall be seven eyes, and behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. Christ's death was the first step in restoring the Garden of Eden, in restoring the healing of you and of me, in preparation for this healing, that one day of final suffering. I'd like to go to that one day of final suffering and show a parallel to you, if I can. Uh, Turn to John 18. Because God and Christ do not want a wasteland. They want a relationship with their creation. And that garden was supposed to be that. And those thistles and thorns is what we've put in there, not him. John 18. If you ever notice this, before his final suffering, where did he go? Verse 1. Jesus had spoken these words. He went forth with his disciples over the brook of Kedron, where there was a garden. In verse 2, Judas, which betrayed him, knew the place. Why? Because Jesus often went there with his disciples. He wanted to be in a garden with his people. In verse 4, Judas, of course, coming to, to catch him, it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said to them, 
Whom seek you? Remember in the garden, where are you, Adam? Now we reverse that. It's who are you looking for? Christ is returning that. And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And Judas, with betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said to them, I'm he, they fell over backwards to the ground, which should have told them something <laughs> right there. And he again asked them, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I have told you, I am he. If you seek me, let these men go their way. Just like in the garden, he was still protecting his people and still helping them. Is it a surprise he liked gardens? He wanted a relationship with his disciples. He wanted to be in a place of peace, a place that would not have the thorns and the thistles. But if we look at this again, we see Satan is back in the garden again, the same way. John 19 just the next chapter. In verse 2, John 19, And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on the robe. A crown of thorns. What did it say in Genesis? Thistles and thorns will it bring forth to you. And here Jesus Christ is getting a crown of thistles and thorns put on his head. And he bore it proudly, and he bore it well. He knew he would have a royal crown coming. But he did that for you, and he did it for me. And just like that thistles and thorns in the garden, he bore those for us. We have to be willing to bear the thorns of this world. There's a lot of things that we have to do to turn the other cheek, to love each other, to build a relationship. It's what God wants. Yeah, the Garden of Eden is beautiful, but it's about people. I've sat in a lot of gardens in this world and travels, and they're beautiful, but when you're by yourself, there's nothing there unless there's people around you in a relationship. And that's what they wanted. And then, of course, then Christ is killed, and they, what did they do? They took him to a garden to bury him. The garden theme of Eden and trying the restoration of man and God is about what this is about. You know, the first feast in the spring are about us. It's about learning about sin, Christ's sacrifice, our part in that. The last fall feasts are about the rest of the world and how they get to be part of it, and our role in that part is part of that. Christ accepted the pain and the blood and the toil and the tears. Adam did die, and through Christ we're going to be made alive, and restoration is coming. This feast is going to happen. It's all going to be there. God's Spirit renews mankind. He takes us back to the tree of life. In the message in Revelation 2.7 with Ephesians, it says, Blessed is he who has a right to the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. That's where we're going. I find it fascinating in all the religions of the world that I've studied traveling, almost everyone has a tree of life in it. Reading from Vince's World Studies, it says the, uh, the figure of the tree of life appears in almost all mythologies from India to Scandinavia. The rabbins and Mohammedans call it the probation tree, the Zen of Esta has its the tree of life, the death destroyer. There's another one that grows by the water of life and drinking its saps confers immortality. The Hindu tree of life is pictured growing out of a great seed in the midst of expanse of water, with, crowned with the sun and various things. Buddha preps meditation sitting by a tree. On the Babylonian cylinders, they have a tree of a palm tree. It's supposed to be a tree of life. These are all myths. Our tree of life is real. It's absolute. It's there. It's not a myth. In Revelation 22, we go there, and we see in verse 5, there shall be no night there. They shall need no candle, neither light of the sun, or the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever in a permanent relationship with God and with Christ and with each other and all the holy angels. And it says, Blessed are those who have the right to this tree of life, to be part of that garden. We get the crown of life. God has offered that to us through his mercy and his blessing. And we take from that tree of life now, Christ, God, our hope of glory. He accepted those thorns, and he accepted the responsibility God gave him in his plan to save you and to save me. We all face a lot of thorns. There's no question but we get to help God restore what was taken away through the garden, through Satan. I ask you to consider your spiritual garden. 
Is it full of thorns and thistles, or is it full of the fruits of the Spirit? We've had a lot of different things have happened. We've had a lot of pride, arrogance. We've had traditions. We've had things that have caused problems for us that should never have done so. But the relationship with God and Christ has to be there. Our garden has to have fresh, flowing water. Our garden has to be filled with flowers. Our garden needs to be loving one another and being willing to take the thorns when they come from the world because they're going to come. We were promised trials to test us, to prove us. I've learned all my lessons through trials and waiting for God to deliver. That's what it's about. And this life is for you and for me to pull out the weeds, to get rid of them, to turn the hearts back to God's spiritual values, to his way of life, the way of life that Christ taught. And there will be thorns. There will be things that, that uh, we will face, wrongs. Can you turn the other cheek? Can you forgive? Forgiveness helps you. It doesn't help the other person because you're the ones damaged by those things. Romans 8.22 makes it very clear. It says the whole creation groans and travails in pain until now because it's waiting for the Garden of Eden. It's waiting for that return to fellowship with God and with Christ. And creation wants to return there just as we do. The millennial restoration is about being in the garden, being in a relationship with each other, with God and Christ. I'd ask you to plant spiritual values in your garden. The thorns that we've had in the church have been thorns of pride, thorns of division, thorns of, a, frankly, a lack of humility. And if we can get rid of those things, we can be. And I commend you because there's a spirit here that's, that's wonderful. Because it's not about judging each other. It's about trying to be like God and trying to get back in the garden. And so I'd ask you all to fellowship in the Garden of Eden with God and Jesus Christ and your fellow brethren.